Good evening. On behalf of Beyond Loss TLC and Vikram and Associates, we again welcome Mr. S. Somashekhar, a former district judge from Bangalore. And in fact, when we posted on the YouTube uh, that Mr. Somashekhar will be sharing his knowledge, one of the one of the comments received was that the king is back. So we definitely consider him as a king. And as usual, we are obliged to his family, who on the weekends give time to us so that he can share his legal knowledge. I will ask Trikram to introduce the subject of modes of challenge of civil decree. Over to you, Trikram. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm the wrong person to give any introduction for the fact that I have not practiced much on civil front. You said is absolutely right. He is the king, king of knowledge, king of any particular aspect uh, dealing with law. That simplifies it. And there are a lot of fans, fan following. I don't want to come in between that fan following and the speaker. So that over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Vikas and his knowledge spreading partner, Trivikram. And all my good friends, judicial officers and advocates who have joined. I have chosen this subject with a title which may be a little attractive or it may be a little confusing also. The reason is, every time you have heard me, it used to be a specific provision of the civil procedure code or evidence set with a title. Here, certainly I will be referring to the provisions of civil procedure code. And some of you may be surprised that I will also be referring to provisions of the evidence act in this regard. It is not one particular section in the civil procedure code or any particular order. I will be referring to a few sections in the section portion, one or two orders in the order portion, some sections of the Indian Evidence Act 1872, which from 172024 would be Bharatiya Sashya Dhinema of 2023, which incidentally has not made much inroads into the Indian Evidence Act 1872, except that sections are renumbered, provisos are given some subsections and all that. One easy way to look at, rather find out the relevant provision in the new enactment is subtract 2. If it is 5 in the Act of 1872, it is 3 in 2023. But Act of 1872 ends with 167. Since some exceptions, explanations have all been made independent sections, it comes to 170. The reason is, in the Indian Evidence Act of 1872, to bring it in tune with Information Technology Act, certain presumptions regarding electronic documents were added by way of an amendment. Those things have all been given an independent number so that the new enactment will have 170 sections. It is totally beside the subject, something collateral to the subject, because you would be hearing this word collateral from me at least once or twice during today's presentation. The audience generally used to be junior advocates. I believe so. Some of them have been practicing the trial courts. Most of which, which I tell will be relevant to their functioning in the trial courts. Over a period of time, they may also start practicing the appellate courts. Now also they will be going. It might be of some help to them. Not in detail as to the regular procedure regarding the appeals and other things. There is something there which I am relating to the subject that I am discussing today. The title of the subject is Modes of Challenge to a Decree. So first we should know what a decree is, what are the different kinds of decrees, then different modes of challenging a decree, different modes of challenging different kinds of decrees. That would be the broad outline. I know I am speaking to an audience which consists of some experienced judicial officers 
and experienced advocates. But as I have been always telling, my target group is the younger members of the bar. I need to take them through some provisions of the Civil Procedure Code only to enable them to know what actually I am trying to ultimately convey to the entire audience. Please have a look at the definition of decree in Section 2, 2 CPC. I request the younger members of the bar to give complete attention to what I am telling. Decree means the formal expression of an adjudication which, so far as the court expressing it, conclusively determines the rights of the parties with regard to all or any of the matters in controversy in the suit. This is a definition which you have got by rote. In substance, a decree is one which is passed after adjudication, after framing issues, after trial takes place, and finally there is a determination of the list between the parties. It may be either preliminary or final. What is that preliminary and final is also explained in the explanation to section 2, subsection 2. A decree is preliminary when further proceedings have to be taken before the suit can be completely disposed of. It is final when such adjudication completely disposes of the suit. It may be partly preliminary and partly final. For my today's presentation, there is no need to go into this detail, but for a limited purpose, you should also know that there is what is known as a preliminary decree, then followed by a final decree in certain kinds of suits, more particularly this partition suit, suits or possession, where mean profits is sought, dissolution of partnership, accounts, administration, and a few other provisions, all of them you will get in Order 20 CPC. I did not read the main part of subsection 2 of section 2 in entirety. I stopped with the word preliminary or final. It shall be deemed to include the rejection of a plight and the determination of any question within section 144. So now, a decree is something which is passed after adjudication of the dispute between the parties. It includes a rejection of a plaint under Order 7 or Rule 11 CPC. Then, determination of question within the meaning of Section 144. For those who are uninitiated, 144 provides for a remedy by way of restitution. One simple example will be sufficient. A decree for eviction is passed either ex parte or after contest. The plaintiff executes the decree and takes possession through the court. The defendant either prefers an appeal under section 96 right with order 41 rule 1 CPC or he may file a petition under order 9 rule 13 CPC for setting aside the ex parte decree. Both the remedies are available. You will soon discover that section 96 CPC also provides for an appeal against an ex parte decree. If the trial court which has passed the ex parte decree sets aside that ex parte decree under Order 9 Rule 13, or the appellate court in an appeal under section 96 Red Order 41 sets aside the ex parte decree, the matter has to be, if the matter has to go to the trial court, trial has to take place. In the meantime, plaintiff decree holder would have taken possession of the property through the agency of the court. So, till that appeal, till the suit is disposed of on merits, defendant can be put back in possession. He has a right, he has a remedy under section 144 CPC restitution. He will be put back to the position in which he was before the decree came to be passed. So, the court passes an order on a petition under section 144 CPC, that order also amounts to a decree. So, what is its implication? So, number one, if it is a decree on contest, a regular an appeal lies under 96 or order 41. If it is rejection of plight under order 7, rule 11, since it amounts to a decree, an appeal lies. 
then if an order is passed in a proceeding under section 144 cpc that also amounts to a decree and therefore an appeal lies what is not included in the definition of the decree is stated in class a and b it is not necessary for today's purpose now section 2 subsection 2 though it gives the definition of the term decree in some of declaratory language and also inclusive language still is incomplete. There is some there are some other provisions in the civil procedure code which also indicate to us that the orders passed there and there would also amount to a decree. One such is order 21 or rule 58 sub rule 4 CPC. 21 rule 58 sub rule 4 CPC. For those who have some knowledge of the execution proceedings, in execution for a decree, in execution of a decree for money, the property of the judgment debtor can be attached and sold. From the proceeds of the sale, the decree amount would be given to the decree holder. Now, of course, a detailed procedure is contemplated for that attachment and the sale, and that requires a separate session. I am not touching upon it. When the property is attached, some person may make a petition, which is called laying a claim or an objection to the attachment, saying that the property was not liable to attachment, either on the ground that the property did not belong to the judgment debtor, but it belonged to him. That is the person who has filed the petition, or the property was not liable to attachment at all for some reason. Let's say detailed adjudication. After that adjudication, an order is passed. What is that order that is passed? That is contained in sub rule 3 of rule 58 of order 21. Upon the determination of the questions referred to in sub rule 3, the court shall, in accordance with that determination, Allow the claim or objection and release the property from attachment. Disallow the claim or objection. Continue the attachment subject to any market, etc. Pass such order. So these are the various types of orders which the executing court can pass in a proceeding for adjudication of a claim to attachment or an objection regarding attachment. What is the effect of that order? That is contained in sub rule 4. Where any claim or objection has been adjudicated upon under this rule, the order made thereon shall have the same force and be subject to the same conditions as to appeal or otherwise as if it were a decree. Therefore, an adjudication to order 21 rule 58 also amounts to a decree and an appeal lies under section 96 read with order 41 CPC. For those who are not exposed to this, let me make it very clear. An appeal under order 43, that is section 104, rhetoric order 43 does not lie. See, order 43 contains a list of orders which are appealable. They are not decrees. So 21 rule 58, it is an order which the court passes. But that order has the force of a decree and therefore an appeal lies under section 96, read with order 41 CPC. As something in connection with this, though not totally relevant to today's topic, which also may be noticed by Minna, kept in view by the participants. Now, sub rule 1 of rule 58 provides that objection can be raised for this attachment or a claim can be preferred. There are two riders for this. If as on the date of the application filed for raising the claim, raising the claim or objections, if the property attached had already been sold, the court cannot entertain a petition for attachment because the property is already sold. Or the claim or objection is unnecessarily delayed or designedly delayed long after the attachment, the application is filed. In such an event, the court will not entertain it. At the threshold itself, the court will reject the application. There it does not amount to a decree. Then once the court entertains the claim or objection, and holds an adjudication under subroute, holds an adjudication as provided by subrule 2, passes an order under subrule 3, 
that will have the effect of a degree under sub rule 4. Well, of course, if under as per sub rule 1 proviso, the application is not entertained at the threshold itself, rejected at the threshold, there is still the remedy for the aggrieved person to file a separate suit that is covered by sub rule 5. They are not interested in that today. So, therefore, an adjudication under R21 Rule 58 amounts to a decree and an appeal lies. Then have a look at R21 Rule 103. Now, there is a decree for possession or eviction. A landlord files a suit against the tenant for eviction or if the demised premises, that is, the premises which is let out is covered by the provisions of the local rent laws. Then a eviction petition under that uh, law, or maybe in some states, those rent acts also provide for a suit there enter. In such an event, or in a regular suit for possession based on title or whatever it is, or on prior possession, if a decree is passed for possession and some obstruction is caused to the decree holder, at the time of taking possession or as I told you in pursuance to a decree for money the property of the judgment debtor can be attached and sold the court will hold a public auction a person will buy in the public auction he is called the auction purchaser if he is obstructed in taking possession of the property then he and the decree holder who has obtained a decree for possession or eviction can maintain an application under Rule 97. Similarly, pursuant to such a decree for possession while execution, somebody other than the judgment debtor is dispossessed, he has also a remedy under 21 Rule 99 to make an application. This is as per the statutory provisions. Of course, decisions are a legion uh, explaining the position in a totally different way. Let us not go into those details. Now, if it is an application under Rule 97 by a decree holder for possession or by an auction purchaser, the adjudication is done under Rule 98. If it is an application by the person who has been dispossessed and he makes the application under Rule 99, adjudication is done under Rule 100. What are the questions the executing court will determine during the course of such adjudication are contained in Rule 101. 102, there is no need for me to speak to you today. But have a look at 103. Where an application has been adjudicated upon under Rule 98 or Rule 100, the order made thereon shall have the same force and be subject to the same conditions as to an appeal or otherwise, as if it were a decree. Therefore, if an adjudication is made, in a proceeding under 21 Rule 97 or Rule 99, it amounts to a decree and an appeal lies under Section 96 and with Order 41 CPC. Uh, one judicial officer who always joins online, on time, is here. In fact, he had brought to my notice a decision of the Karnataka High Court. The proposition is this. If a decree for eviction is passed in a proceeding under the Rent Act and the decree holder files an execution petition and if during the pendency of the, in the, during the course of that execution, some application is filed under Rule 97 or Rule 99, an order is passed, though it has the effect of a decree, an appeal under Section 96 of CPC Red with Order 41 does not lie. It, a revision has to be preferred under the Karnataka Rent Act. That's the legal position. Uh, as I said, one officer whom I see in the video uh, got me that decision, a decision of the Karnataka High Court. Maybe the position may be different or the same thing in other states. I am not aware of it. So that may also be kept in view. So therefore, there are demon decrees. One, rejection of a plaint. Determination of a question under 144, determination of a question under 21 Rule 58, determination of a question under 21 Rule 97, 99, 
under 103, it amounts to a decree. Then we have judgment on basis of admissions made by the defendant. Just have a look at Order 12, Rule 6. I think on some other occasion I have spoken about it. I am not very sure whether I spoke on this platform about this. Please have a look at Order 12, Rule 6. <clears throat> Where admissions of fact have been made, either in the pleading or otherwise, whether orally or in writing, the court may at any stage of the suit, either on the application of any party or of its own motion, and without waiting for the determination of any other questions between the parties, make such order or give such judgment as it may think fit, having regard to such admissions. Subrule 2 is important for our purpose. Whenever a judgment is pronounced under Subrule 1, a decree shall be drawn up in accordance with the judgment, and the decree shall bear the date on which the judgment was pronounced. I am referring to this provision again when I take up section 96. For the present, you should be very clear about this. A judgment on admission is not like a consent decree against which an appeal can lie or it is not a compromise decree. What happens usually is the entire claim may not be admitted by the defendant. Maybe in a suit for recovery of rent, he may admit the rate of rent or he may deny the dispute the rate of rent and say, this is the rate of rent. If rent is calculated at this rate, this will be the amount due from me. Certainly, I am due some amount. Well, I am prepared to pay it. Based on that admission, there could be a decree. In a or in any money suit, if the defendant admits a claim to some extent, there can be immediately a decree there. Then, in a partition suit, some properties are claimed to be the self-acquisitions of the defendants. Some are admitted to be joint family properties. They don't set up a prior partition. They even go to the extent of saying that we have no objection to pass a decree in respect of these items, which we admit as joint family properties. They may also say, we are, we are prepared to pay court fee. Our share may also be demarcated. In such an event, there will be a decree on admission or a judgment on admission based on undisputed claim and facts and about there will be another decree after contest. Two decrees are permissible in such a situation. So therefore, a decree for admission, I mean a judgment on admission, the rule says it is a judgment on admission. And after that judgment, the reason is this. According to the plaintiff, it is a clear admission made by the defendant. According to the defendant, it is not an admission at all. I have got something else to say. It is not an unqualified admission. It is not a clear admission. The case law is to the effect that unless that admission is unequivocal and very clear, unambiguous, then only the court pass can pass a judgment followed by a decree under Order 12, Rule 6. Therefore, though not a very detailed adjudication, some adjudication has to be done even when the court passes a judgment under Order 12, Rule 6, in which event a decree is done, therefore an appeal lies. This is very, very important in the context of the next provision which I am referring to. Please go to Section 96 CPC. It is the substantive provision regarding appeal. Before that, I want to tell something. Whether it is an appeal under the provisions of the Civil Procedure Code or the Criminal Procedure Code or any special enactment, Income Tax Act, whatever enactment is, unless the statute provides for an appeal, there is no right of appeal. Whereas a plaintiff has a right to file a suit if it is a, dis if it is a dispute of a civil nature as covered by Section 9 CPC. No authority is required to say that a civil suit lies. But when it comes to an appeal, there is no question of entertaining an appeal in the interest of justice. No, he has no remedy. The trial court has passed an order, a the order. What shall I do? Nothing. The statute should provide for an appeal. So too on the criminal side and the criminal procedure court against which kinds of uh, orders or judgments an appeal lies. That is provided. The number of uh, special enactments also, there is a right of appeal, there is a right of revision. So, an appeal is a right created by a statute. 
there is nothing like entertaining and appealing the interest of justice or under 151 CPC or under Article 21 and all that nothing. A statute should provide for it. Now, the substantive provisions regarding an appeal against a decree, and I have given the definition of the decree, is Section 96 CPC. Just have a look at it. Appeals from original decrees. Save where otherwise expressly provided in the body of this code or by any other law for the time being in force, an appeal shall lie from every decree passed by any court. Though normally the appellant says it is an appeal against the judgment and decree passed by the trial court in such and such a case, judges also, we also say the judgment, it is an appeal against the judgment and decree passed in such and such a case by such and such a court. Technically, an appeal lies under section 96 CPC against a decree. From appeal for, shall lie from every decree passed by any court exercising original jurisdiction to the court authorized to hear appeals from the decisions of such court. It would be of some interest to those who had not discovered it so far that the civil procedure court nowhere says to which court the appeal lies. It is the local civil courts acts which tell us which court at which court the plaintiff or the defendant has to appeal. In Karnataka, we have the Karnataka Civil Courts Act of 1964. Civil procedure does not say which is to that which is that court where an appeal has to be filed. That's why it says to the court authorized to hear appeals. Then an appeal may lie from an original decree past ex parte. So there are two remedies for a defendant who has suffered an ex parte decree. Why should I say who has suffered an ex parte decree as, the, as though the court has committed a mistake in passing an ex parte decree? If the summons is duly certainly has not come, it is not the court's mistake to say that. So therefore, there is a decree against him, an ex parte decree. Uh, though normally say he has suffered a decree, I don't agree with that. There is a decree against him. Uh, it may lie from an original decree past ex parte. He has got two remedies. One to file a petition under Order 9 Rule 13 CPC for setting aside that ex parte decree. Another remedy is sub rule 2. Of course, he can't uh, opt both of them. Only one of them. Let's also provide it. Then, sub rule 4. Then, sub rule 3. Uh, subsection 3. No appeal shall lie from a decree passed by the court with the consent of parties. This is important for us. On the last occasion when I spoke about Order 23 on this platform, I did refer to this, but today in a different context, I am referring to it again. Of course, for a very long time, I had a view that a consent decree is not the same thing as a compromise decree. Even to this day, I hold the view personally, but I am bound by judgments of the Supreme Court which have taken the view that a compromise decree is also a consent decree and therefore an appeal does not lie. This I am telling, let us not confuse ourselves with the provisions of Order 12, Rule 6, where a decree is passed on admission, rather a judgment is passed on admission followed by a decree, with a consent decree referred to in 96.3 or a compromise decree under Order 23. See, as I told you already, under Order 12, Rule 6, to pass a judgment on admission, it must be an unequivocal, clear, unambiguous admission. The court should be satisfied about it. Then only it can pass a decree on a judgment on admission, then draw a decree. So if the defendant says that there is no such admission at all, which empowers the court to pass a decree or entitles the plaintiff to have a decree on admission, well, if the court is also satisfied, that it cannot pass a decree on admission. So therefore, it cannot be said to be a consent decree in this context. So it will be a decree against which an appeal lies under Section 96 CPC, read with Order 41. But if it is a decree by consent or by compromise, statute says no appeal lies. Then subsection 4, no appeal shall lie except in a question of law from a decree in any suit of the nature cognizable by the court of small causes 
when the amount or the value of the subject matter of the original suit does not exceed 10,000 rupees. Uh, to my knowledge, in Karnataka, under the Karnataka Small Tasses Court Act, a remedy by way of revision is preferred for the person who against whom a decree is passed. There is no appeal there under the Karnataka Small Tasses Court Act. Position may be the same elsewhere also. Now, there are other things relating to appeals. That's not the topic for discussion here. Now, what does it mean ultimately? From a reading of these various provisions, we have seen a decree is passed, followed by been prior to that, preceded by a judgment on adjudication. This is the usual thing that happens. If a plaint is rejected in order 7, rule 11, that's also a decree. If a Petition is disposed of under section 144, it is also a decree. An adjudication done under 21 rule 58 is also a decree. An adjudication done under 21 rule 97, 99 is also a decree. Then judgment or admissions under order 12 rule 6, they are all decrees. So I have now told what are the different categories of decrees. A compromise decree, I will come to it at the end. Now, we will now see different modes of challenging this decree. So, if it is a decree on adjudication or if it is a decree when the plaint is rejected under Order 7, Rule 11 or a question is determined under Section 144 or an adjudication under 21, Rule 58 or under 21, Rule 97, 99 or under Order 12, Rule 6, the mode of challenging it is by way of an appeal under section 96 read with order 41. In Karnataka, we call it as a regular appeal. Some states they use it, some states they have got a different uh, nomenclature for all that. Whatever it is, that is why I am avoiding the word regular, which I used to use regularly when I was speaking to officers and advocates from Karnataka. So it is not, I don't say it as regular appeal because different states there may have different expressions. It is an appeal under section 96, read with order 41. Then, I told you, there can be a preliminary decree and also a final decree. A person aggrieved by a preliminary decree has to challenge it by way of an appeal under section 96, read with order 41. He does not choose to challenge that preliminary decree. Then a final decree is passed. An appeal lies against the final decree also. An appeal lies against the preliminary decree. An appeal lies against the final decree. An appeal under 96. If the person aggrieved by the preliminary decree does not choose to challenge the preliminary decree, he cannot, after the final decree is passed, question the preliminary decree. So, preliminary decree has to be challenged immediately thereafter within the period of limitation provided by the Limitation Act. If he chooses not to challenge the preliminary decree, then he can't wait. All right, let there be a final decree. I'll ch challenge both the preliminary decree and the final decree. No, that cannot be done. Where you do get it? You will get it in section 97 CPC. <clears throat> Where any party aggrieved by a preliminary decree passed after the commencement of this court does not appeal from such a decree, he shall be precluded from disputing its correctness in any appeal which may be preferred for the final decree. I repeat, the person aggrieved by the preliminary decree has to challenge it. If he does not choose to challenge it, thereafter a final decree is passed, he cannot attack the preliminary decree in an appeal against the final decree. He has to confine his grounds only to the mistake in the final decree, not in the preliminary decree. So, modes of challenge in the decree are contained in section 96. Then we have a compromise decree or a decree by consent under 96.3. It is also a decree. There is a bar under order 23 rule 3A CPC for filing a suit to set aside a compromise decree. No regular, no appeal lies under section 96 because 96.3 is clear. 
no appeal lies under section 104 repeat order 43 what then is the remedy of a person who wants to challenge the compromise decree you will wait for some more time uh, last time i have covered it but uh, subsequent to my presentation about two months back on this subject there are a few more decisions with, uh, because i checked it from my notes those decisions maybe were not yet reported or i had not uh, noted them or i did not bring them to your notice Anyway, there is no change in the legal position. I will speak about challenge a compromise decree at the end. Since I had spoken about temperature order 23, I did not think it necessary again to deal with this. But anyway, I thought that I should also deal with it that I have reserved at the end. Now, I am on a different point. There is what is known as a valid decree and a white decree. This is extremely important. Uh, please give full attention to what I am telling you. A decree is valid. A decree is also white. What is the remedy to avoid a valid decree? Appeal. An appeal. There will be some situations a suit can also be filed that I will tell later. If it is a wide decree, what is the remedy? I will take it step by step. To understand this, we, should, we need to know one concept. Error in jurisdiction and error of jurisdiction. Error in jurisdiction and error of jurisdiction. What is this? A court has got jurisdiction to decide a matter. It could be territorial, it could be pecuniary, it could be jurisdiction over the subject matter, the suit. In exercise of its jurisdiction, in a, a I mean exercise in that jurisdiction, it passes a decree. Certainly one person is aggrieved. He has a right of appeal. He may be able to convince the appellate court that the decree is wrong. An error is committed by the trial judge. But the decree is not wide. It is a valid decree till it is set aside. A person suffers a decree. It is a valid decree. It may be an incorrect decree in his, in a, in his view. But his remedy is to challenge it. Therefore, so long as a judge has the jurisdiction to decide a matter, the law is he can decide it rightly or he can decide it wrongly. It does not give a license to the judges to deliberately uh, decide it wrongly. But uh, that is precisely the reason why there is an appeal. So, so long as a court has jurisdiction to decide a matter, there can be an error in it. It is called error in jurisdiction. If there is an error in exercise in the jurisdiction and a decree is passed, it is still a valid decree. It is not a wide decree at all. To challenge that valid decree, which in the view of the aggrieved person, is not a current decree. Current decree may be one thing, a valid decree is by valid decree. It is not a current decree. His remedy is to challenge it by way of an appeal. But what is the position with regard to a wide decree? For that, you should know what that wide decree is. Before that, there is an interesting passage in Sartar's Evidence Act that I would read it. I have taken it from the Law of Evidence by Sartar, Volume 1, 16th edition, 2007 edition. From Law of Evidence by Sartar, Volume 1, 16th edition, 2007. This is revised at enlarged by Sudeep Sartar and V. R. Manohar. This particular edition is revised by Revised and enlarged by Sudeep Sartar and V.R. Manohar. 
I'm deliberately giving these details because there are number of puts on evidence that by Sartar of different names. The one which I am now referring is that authored by that stalwart Sartar, which is revised and enlarged in 2007. In page 965 of this book, dealing with section 44 of the evidence set, about which I will speak with some more details, this is what is stated. Want of jurisdiction must be distinguished from irregular or erroneous exercise of jurisdiction. This is very important. Want of jurisdiction must be distinguished from irregular or erroneous exercise of jurisdiction. So therefore, want of jurisdiction, if an error is committed, it is thought an error of jurisdiction. Outside your jurisdiction, you have entertained a matter, you have committed an error. Even if the judgment is otherwise valid, all points are considered, but it is given by a court which had no jurisdiction at all. It is still a wide degree or invalid degree. But if you have got jurisdiction, and even if you pass a wrong order, it is still a valid degree till it is not set aside. Want of jurisdiction must be distinguished from irregular or erroneous exercise of jurisdiction. If a court has jurisdiction to take partisans of any matter before it, but decides it erroneously or exercises its jurisdiction irregularly, its judgment is not a nullity till it is set right by an appropriate proceeding in a proper court. Jurisdiction does not depend on the correctness of a decision. Jurisdiction depends upon the statutory provision. It says, well, this court has got jurisdiction to entertain that matter. What if the court does not have jurisdiction? This requires some deliberation. We will deal with that. For this, you need to have a look at section 21 CPC. <laughs> Objections to jurisdiction. No objection as to the place of suing shall be allowed by any appellate or revisional court unless such objection was taken in the court of first instance at the earliest possible opportunity and in all cases where issues are settled at or before such settlement and unless there has been a consequent failure of justice. Therefore, want of territorial jurisdiction, that is, place of suing, does not render the decision invalid. The defendant, if he wants to raise the question of the want of territorial jurisdiction, has to raise it immediately. The time limit is, if it is a case where issues are required to be framed, where issues are settled at or before such settlement. Thereafter, he can't raise it. And in the appellate court, a contention cannot be taken that the trial court did not have territorial jurisdiction. Please be very clear about this. It is not an invalid decree. A decree passed by a court which does not have territorial jurisdiction is not an invalid decree. The appellate court cannot reverse the decree of the trial court only on the ground that the trial court lacked a territorial jurisdiction. One exception is called out unless there has been a consequent failure of justice. It is a very, very rare situation. It is very difficult to demonstrate. Such a situation is very rare. The, the usual ground, uh, they said the failure of justice, no. The person who challenges a decree on the ground that the trial court lacked a territorial jurisdiction will have to clearly demonstrate and establish before the appellate court what is that failure of justice which has ensued on account of the trial court assuming territorial jurisdiction when it did not have. Very rare situation. So we can safely proceed at the basis want of territorial jurisdiction is not a ground available to the appellate, is not a ground available to the appellate judge to set aside the decree. Subsection 2. 
No objection as to the competence of a court with reference to the pecuniary limits of its jurisdiction shall be allowed by any appellate or revisional court unless such objection was taken in the court of first instance at the earliest possible opportunity and in all cases where issues are settled at or before such settlement and unless there has been a consequent failure of justice. So section, subsection 1 and 2, they are similarly worded. Subsection 1 refers to territorial jurisdiction. Subsection 2 refers to pecuniary jurisdiction. So the net effect of section 3, subsection 3 it refers to the competence of the executing court. Let us not worry about it. So 21.1 and 21.2 make it very clear. If the trial court lack either territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction, the judgment is not void. Judgment is not a delity. It is still a valid decree unless it is set aside. The appellate court cannot reverse that de decree only on the ground that the trial court lacked territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction. Then go to Rule 21A, <coughs> Section 21A. <coughs> no suit shall lie challenging the validity of a decree passed in a former suit between the same parties or between the parties under whom they or any of them claim litigating under the same title on any ground based on an objection as to the place of suing. Of course, there is the principle of res judicata. Secondly, it says merely because the former court which passed the decree did not have territorial jurisdiction, only on that ground, the a second suit will not lie. That is clear from section 21A. Thus far, there is no problem. A slight problem we find in the language of section 99 CPC. Uh, 21, I made it clear. 99, have a look at 99. 99, you find, finds a place in part 7 dealing with appeals. 96, 97, 98, 98 is not necessary. 93, let us, 99, let us read it. No decree shall be reversed or substantially varied, nor shall any case be remanded in appeal on account of any misjoinder or non-joinder of parties or causes of action <coughs> or any error, defect or irregularity in any proceeding in the suit not affecting the merits of the case or the jurisdiction of the court. Proviso is not necessary. It speaks of... Uh, the effect of non joint of a necessary party. 21, 1 and 2 will tell us that the appellate court cannot interfere in the judgment of the trial court only on the ground that the trial court lack of territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction. If we just read section 99 CPC without reading section 21 CPC, some provision of the court fiat and some reported decisions we may be justified in concluding, well, if the trial court lacked jurisdiction, the appellate court can interfere with that. This position has been explained by the Supreme Court, about which I will tell you. Now, in the state of Karnataka, we have the Karnataka Court Fees and Suits Valuation Act. There, Section 51 would say that the appellate court cannot reverse the decision of the trial court only on the ground that it lacked that it lacked pecuniary jurisdiction, and that section starts the non-obstante clause saying notwithstanding anything contained in section 99 CPC. Therefore, want of pecuniary jurisdiction will not empower the appellate court want of pecuniary jurisdiction on the part of the trial court will not empower the appellate court to reverse the decree in view of that provision uh, because maybe there are certain provisions in other states also. Very shortly, I am referring to a very leading judgment of the Supreme Court on that point that would make the position clear. Notwithstanding anything contained in section 99 CPC, that is how it says. Of course, it refers to pecuniary jurisdiction. But what's the position with regard to the territorial jurisdiction? We have a very beautiful decision of the Supreme Court 
which all of you will take pain to read at one point of time or the other. We have this beautiful judgment of the Supreme Court in Kiran Singh versus Chaman Pasha. <coughs> Kiran Singh versus Chaman Pasha reported in AR 1954 Supreme Court 340. AR 1954 Supreme Court 340. <clears throat> this is a judgment by four judges of the Supreme Court. I have yet to find out how an even number of uh, uh, judges would be on the larger bench also. Because two we have understood, then anything larger is odd number 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, like that. But I don't know how uh, at one point of time there could be even number of judgment judges on the bench of the Supreme Court, even though it was not a division bench. Very eminent judges of those yester years. B.K. Mukherjee, Vivian Bose, Gulam Hassan, and Venkat Ramayar. The judgment is by Venkat Ramayar. Speaking of Vivian Bose, Whenever you get an occasion to read any of his judgments, either in civil law or criminal law, please read it. It will be really enlightening. One particular judgment in the context of section 300 IPC, culpable homicide and murder. Of course, I need to find out the corresponding provisions uh, in this uh, new enactment. Something totally different. <coughs> now, see, this was a case where the uh, question was whether the trial court which passed the decree had pecuniary jurisdiction. Of course, the matter reached the Supreme Court. Supreme Court in 1953. So obviously, it should have. Been, the trial court should have a suit should have been entertained long back in the trial court and all that. One contention that was urged before the Supreme Court was that the trial court lacked pecuniary jurisdiction. If that was the valuation for purposes of filing the suit, appeal should have been filed for a different court. Appeal has been filed in some other court because the valuation was something more and all that. So an argument was canvassed saying that it is a nullity. Judgment is a nullity because the trial court which passed the decree had no pecuniary jurisdiction. I am repeatedly telling the relevant provision of the Karnataka Court Fees Act speaks about pecuniary jurisdiction. Obviously, Court Fees Act cannot speak about territorial jurisdiction. It starts with a non abstante class, notwithstanding anything contained in section 99. 99 at first blush gives an indication that want of jurisdiction is a ground which the appellant can set up in the appeal court. The appellate court can reverse it. But what is the effect of 21, 99, 11? All those things will have to be. Uh, 51 of the court, 15. In, in some other states, it may be different provision. In this 1954 Supreme Court, the corresponding provision of that state enactment was Section 11 of the Courts Fees Act. Please hear me this. The answer to these tactics must depend on what the position in law is when a court entertains a suit or an appeal over which it has no jurisdiction. And what is the effect of Section 11 of the Suits Valuation Act is on that position. Officers and lawyers from Karnataka don't confuse this Section 11. Section 11 here refers to pecuniary, I mean, jurisdiction, pecuniary jurisdiction, whether the appellate court can uh, reverse the judgment of the trial court only on the ground of want of pecuniary jurisdiction. Section 11 of the Suits Valuation Act of that state is not in pari materia with Section 11 of our Act. Section 11 of our Act deals with a different thing. A preliminary issue has to be tried, has to be framed whenever a question of insufficiency of court fear, want of pecuniary jurisdiction is raised. 
provision corresponding to section 11 of that act is 51 of the Karnataka Court Peace and Suits Valuation Act. The answer to these contentions must depend on what the position in law is when a court entertains a suit or an appeal over which it has no jurisdiction and what the effect of section 11 of the Suits Valuation Act is on that position. It is a fundamental principle well established that a decree passed by a court without jurisdiction is a nullity and that its invalidity could be set up whenever and wherever it is sought to be enforced or relied upon, even at the stage of execution and even in collateral proceedings. Execution, I will tell you, collateral proceedings also I will tell you because I am very much interested in the collateral proceeding. A defect, a defect of jurisdiction, whether it is pecuniary or territorial, or whether it is in respect to the subject matter of the action, strikes at the very authority of the court to pass any decree, and such a defect cannot be cured even by consent of parties. Now, this particular line in this judgment gives an indication that if the trial court lacks territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction or jurisdiction of the subject matter of the suit, the judgment is a nullity. I may tell you here, in some commentary on CPC, only this slide found in this judgment is extracted and it is likely to lead uh, the readers to a, con to a wrong uh, opinion or a wrong conclusion that want of territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction also renders the judgment a nullity. But let us take pains to read the whole judgment or at least the relevant portions. <clears throat> If the question now under consideration felt to be determined only at the application of general principles governing the matter, there can be no doubt that the district court of Mangir was quorum non judice and that its judgment and decree would be nullities. What that quorum non judice, I will tell you. The question is what is the effect of section 11 of the Suits Valuation Act on this position? Then, a reference is made to section 11 of the uh, or the Source Valuation Act of that state, then 578 of the Civil Procedure Code, maybe some amendments in that state, then 99 CPC. After examining all this, this is what the Supreme Court has said. Please hear me very carefully. Don't be carried away by these lines which you find in one para of the judgment. I am not giving the para number because I have not taken it. Uh, yes, this uh, SCC, I mean, um, I have taken it from some uh, uh, internet. Therefore, uh, the para numbers may not tally in that. Uh, I do. Anyway, I am reading para 6. Uh, the, here it says, the policy underlying sections 21 and 99 of the Civil Procedure Code and section 11 of the Suits Valuation Act is the same, namely, that when a case had been tried by a court on the merits and judgment rendered, it should not be liable to be reversed purely on technical grounds unless it has resulted in failure of justice and the policy of the legislature has been policy of the legislature has been to treat objections to jurisdiction both territorial and pecuniary as technical and not open to consideration by an appellate court unless there has been a prejudice on the merits. So therefore, this judgment makes it abundantly clear when we read it very carefully that want of territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction on the part of the trial court will not render its judgment and decree a nullity. Let us be very clear about this. Let us not be under the impression that it is a decision of 1954 and that is not the law now. We have a host of decisions on that point. Time is not sufficient for me to refer to all those decisions. Neither there is any need. Having started from 1954, I will end up with 2019, end up only on this point, not the session. 2019, 3 SCC 594. 2019, 3 SCC 594. Snehalata Goyal versus Pushpalata and others. Snehalata Goyal versus Pushpalata. Others. This judgment is by the present CJI as it then was, Dr. D.Y. Chandrachud. The decision in this current thing, which I cited now, has also been referred to in this judgment. 
section 21 CPC has been referred to. And this is what the Supreme Court observes. This provision, that is section 21, which the legislature has designedly adopted, would make it abundantly clear that an objection to the want of territorial jurisdiction does not travel to the root of or to the inherent lack of jurisdiction of a civil court to entertain this suit. What is that inherent jurisdiction? Just wait. I will make a passing reference to section 9 and tell you. So, want of territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction does not go to the root of the matter. Hence, it has to be raised before the court of first instance at the earliest opportunity and in all cases where issues are settled on or before such settlement. Moreover, it is only there is a consequent failure of justice, only where there is a consequent failure of justice that an objection as to the place of suing can be entertained. Both these conditions have to be satisfied. Then after referring to Kiran Singh, this is what the Supreme Court says. This, the court in Kiran Singh disallowed the objection to jurisdiction on the ground that no objection was raised at the first instance and that the party filing the suit was precluded from raising an objection to jurisdiction of that court at the appellate stage. The court concluded thus, I have already read out that portion from Kiran Singh. Then this is what uh, the Supreme Court in Sneha Tata says. Thus, where the defecting jurisdiction is of a kind which falls within section 21 CPC, that is both pecuniary or territorial, or section 11 of the Suits Valuation Act, an objection to jurisdiction cannot be raised except in the manner and subject to the conditions mentioned there under, that is, there should be a failure of justice. Far from helping the case of the respondent, the judgment in Kiran Singh holds that an objection to territorial jurisdiction and pecuniary jurisdiction is different from an objection to jurisdiction of the subject matter. An objection to the want of territorial jurisdiction does not travel to the root of or to the inherent lack of jurisdiction of a civil court to entertain the suit. As I said, there are a number of decisions between 1954 and 2019. Uh, well, the legal position is this. We have three jurisdictions. CPC tells us about territorial jurisdiction contained in section 16 to 20. Want of territorial jurisdiction, what is its effect is contained in 21.1. CPC does not actually deal so much with the pecuniary jurisdiction. Except section 15 which says all suits will have to be filed in the court of the lowest grade competent to try it. That's all. It is the local civil court act which deal with the pecuniary jurisdiction of the courts and also territorial for that matter. There is another jurisdiction called inherent jurisdiction or jurisdiction over the subject matter, the suit. When I say inherent jurisdiction, it is not inherent power under 151. It is inherent jurisdiction. I need to spend some time on this. Uh, please give me a patient hearing for this. This is very important because the whole purpose of my today's presentation is to speak on that. Though incidentally, taking you directly to that would not help the youngsters. Therefore, I had given some preliminaries. What I am now telling is I am very particular because this is an occasion where you will know what actually the correct legal position is. Those of you who are practicing the civil courts, some junior judicial officers who have joined the judiciary recently, please give full attention to what I am telling. Uh, now, what is this want of inherent jurisdiction or jurisdiction of the subject matter of the suit? In the law college, we have been told there are three kinds of jurisdictions, territorial, pecuniary and uh, jurisdiction of the subject matter. There is some indication of it from section 9 CPC. Let us have a look at it. <laughs> the code shall subject to the provisions herein contained 
have jurisdiction to try all suits of a civil nature, excepting suits of which their partisans is either expressly or impliedly barred. Two explanations are there. What's a suit of a civil nature? I mean, certain kinds of suits, they are also deemed to be suits of civil nature. We know by now matters relating to property, recovery of money, specific performance, partition, we generally take it as suits of civil nature. Section 9 says, if it is a dispute of a civil nature, certainly a civil court has got jurisdiction. The legal position is very clear that no authority is required to say that the court has got jurisdiction because it is presumed we have a very beautiful judgment of Justice M. Hidayatullah on the point, AER 1969 Supreme Court, page 78, <coughs> AER 1969 Supreme Court, 78, Gulabai versus State, <coughs> Madhya Pradesh. <laughs> a very beautiful judgment, even to this day, that is the law. We will learn the basics from that judgment. So, the effect is there is no question. So, no authority is required to say the defendant says, Well, this court has no jurisdiction. It is not for the plaintiff to show that it has not to do, court has not jurisdiction. Because it is a dispute of a civil nature, court cannot also say. Where I have got jurisdiction. It is for the defendant who raises it. It's the legal position. But an exception is carved out in section 9. Subject to the provisions therein contained. Now section 10 says, if a suit is already pending in respect of the same subject matter between the same parties where issues are directly and substantially the same, then the subsequent suit has to be stated. Section 11 incorporates the principle of res judicata. If there is a former suit, it is already tried and subsequently another suit is filed by the same parties, same subject matter, the subsequent suit will not lie. Section 11 res judicata. So these are subject to the provisions herein contained, section 10 and 11. Then section 12 preclusion. I am not spending time on that today. These will not subject to those things. All other suits of a civil nature are maintainable in the civil court. Accepting suits of which their cognizance is either expressly or impliedly part. We have host of special enactments which either expressly take away the jurisdiction of a civil court or impliedly take. For example, we have the Industrial Disputes Act. Well, it does not expressly take away the jurisdiction of a civil court. By implication, the jurisdiction is ousted because the agreed I mean, workman can approach the labor court or the industrial tribunal and all that. Supreme Court has held there is an implied bar. So we have a number of such enactments, land revenue laws. So in respect of revenue disputes, no question of civil court entertaining it. Therefore, if a civil court entertains a matter, in respect of which a special legislation bars it, then it is want of jurisdiction over the subject matter. It is want of inherent jurisdiction. Such a judgment would be a nullity. This, as I said, is quorum non judis. C O R A M quorum non judis. N O N J U D I C E. <coughs> I read it out from 1954 Supreme Court. I am giving the meaning of that expression as found in this Wharton's Concise Law Dictionary. Wharton's Concise Law Dictionary. I have an unconcise law dictionary by Wharton, but same I checked it. Even in that, uh, the same meaning is given. So, Concise Law Dictionary. Quorum non judis, C O R A M, quorum non judis. In the presence of a person, not a judge, this is beautiful. In fact, actually, a judge gives that judgment. But what is the effect of that judgment? As though a person who is not a judge 
it is a judgment written in the absence of a judge a, in the presence of a person not a judge though technically he may be a judge though he may be recruited by the government uh, recruited by the high court appointment is given by the governor he is certainly a judicial officer he is certainly a judge but he has exercised a jurisdiction which he did not have it is not an error in jurisdiction it is an error of jurisdiction if it is an error in jurisdiction it is still a valid decree unless it is set aside either by the appellate court or by the revisional court want of territory been want of jurisdiction over the subject matter the suit or want of inherent jurisdiction goes to the root of the matter as held by supreme court in that kiran sins case so the effect of a judgment given by a court which does not have that inherent jurisdiction or jurisdiction over the subject matter the suit is as though it is given by a person who is not a judge in the absence of a judge quorum non judice when a suit is in the dictionary explains this when a suit is brought and determined in a court which has no jurisdiction in the matter it is said to be quorum non judice and the judgment is void so a judgment given by a court which has no jurisdiction over the subject matter of the suit is a void judgment it is a nullity i repeat if it is want of territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction judgment is not void it is a valid judgment till it is set aside in appeal or in revision party who has suffered the decree has to challenge it by way of an appeal or revision as the case may be but in the case of a void decree what is the position is this i read out 1954 supreme court it says it can be attacked during execution it can be attacked in collateral proceedings now i have told you different categories of decrees different modes of challenging a decree for decrees passed by courts which have pecuniary territorial jurisdiction appeal under section 96 if it is a preliminary decree you will have to challenge it then and there you can't wait till the final decree is passed and challenge the preliminary decree no question of challenge to a compromise decree challenge to a valid decree challenge to a void decree that is a decree which is quorum non judice which is passed by a court which has no jurisdiction over the subject matter what is this number 1 it need not be challenged at all though the title is challenge to a void decree the first thing is it need not be challenged at all you can ignore it i will give examples for this i'll tell you the different modes number 1 it can be ignored because the law is a void transaction can be ignored but if it is void of its the person who has suffered that uh, who is uh, that white transaction or white instrument is going to affect him then he can sue for cancellation under section 31 but it can be ignored also i don't want to challenge it some person who has no jurisdiction has passed this order why should i challenge it i don't challenge it there is nothing wrong in challenging it he can prefer an appeal he can prefer a revision if revision is provided but he can also ignore it well as and when it comes i will do it then there can be an appeal or revision do not need it it is not required to challenge a void decree either by way of an appeal or revision but if he chooses why i should take risk let me challenge it all right do it third it can be challenged by way of a suit also a void decree can be ignored number 1 a void decree can be challenged by way of appeal or revision as the case may be a void decree can be challenged by way of a suit it can be challenged by way of a suit that is why in some of these uh, court fee enactments there is a provision for collection of court fee for determination of court fee for cancellation of uh, instruments and decrees in the karnataka court fees and suits valuation act it is section 38 it provides for determination of court fee in a suit for cancellation of a decree also then it can be challenged in execution proceedings there is one basic principle that is an executing court cannot go behind the decree 
the judgment debtor has to challenge it by way of an appeal or revision. He can't raise contentions during execution. No, the suit is barred. I did not agree to pay so much of interest. I have cleared the entire bill. I was not a tenant at all. Nothing of that kind can be urged because there is already a decree. So the executing court cannot go behind the decree. For this, there is an exception. The exception is, if the decree is void, then even the executing court can examine whether it is a void decree or not. That is an exception. Please go to section 47 CPC. All questions related to execution, discharge or satisfaction of a decree shall have to be determined by the court executing the decree and not by way of a separate suit. So the executing court cannot tell the judgment debtor, well, if it is a void decree, she could have challenged it. Section 47 says, questions relating to execution of the decree. It is not executable at all because it is a void decree. Discharge or satisfaction not necessary for our purpose. That can be decided. We have a number of decisions under section 47 CPC dealing with this aspect of the matter. Some two or three examples might help you to know this. I told you of these uh, rent legislations. Now, a landlord can evict a tenant by filing a suit, a regular a suit, a title suit. If it is a term lease after expiry of the term of lease, otherwise by issue of a quit notice provided by 106, there are different modes by which tenants is terminated under 111 of the transfer of property act. Suppose in the demised premises, that is the premises which is let out, is covered by the provisions of the local rent laws, a civil suit does not lie. It is the court under that act. In some states, they call him a rent controller. In Karnataka, the rent controller under the Karnataka Rent Control Act was a person from the revenue department who was fixing the rate of rent, fair rent and all that. He had some jurisdiction and all that. In some states, the rent controller, they call him. In some courts, a rent court, by whatever name it is thought. In Karnataka, we register it as a HRC proceeding, house rent cases and all that. Now, let us take a case where a landlord files a suit for eviction. Order 7, Rule 1, plaint. <coughs> the office of the court does not know that the lease premises is covered by the provisions of the rent act and the suit does not lie. The plaintiff lawyer may not be knowing it. Defendant lawyer may be knowing or may not be knowing. Knowing also he may just participate in the proceedings only to contend during execution proceedings that the decree is white. The court is also not aware of it because uh, the officer, the judicial officer is posted after transfer. He doesn't know whether this uh, place is covered by the rent act. Either by ignorance or deliberately on the part of the defendant, or even the plaintiff may deliberately file it because uh, there are some stringent provisions under the Rent Act. He has to make out a case for eviction. So, ignoring all that, either by ignorance or deliberately, if a suit is filed and a decree is obtained at the hands of the trial court, decree is confirmed by the first appellate court, by the High Court in second appeal, by the Supreme Court also, common sense would tell us no, it's a decree confirmed by the Supreme Court also. Where is the question of the decree being re-examined, validity can be re-examined by the executive court. The law is, if the decree is wide, passed by a court which had no jurisdiction, which had no inherent jurisdiction, which had no jurisdiction of the subject matter, a court passed by an incompetent court, it is not an incompetent judge, it is not the competency of the judge, it is the competency of the court, it is a wide decree, even in execution proceedings that can be challenged. So the judgment debtor can say, well, I admit that there is a decree against me, decree for eviction against me. It is true that the Honorable Supreme Court has also confirmed the decree. Well, who has passed the decree? A civil court has passed the decree. Well, the decree is white. So nothing can be done in the executing court. The whole process has to be redone by filing a petition for eviction. I will give one more example. We have the Family Courts Act. 
there are places where uh, family courts are established in uh, all district headquarters. There are places where the family court has got jurisdiction only over the district headquarter where it is located. Or in some places, there is no family court at all. I jocularly tell uh, where there is no family court, probably families are happy there because there is no family court. So if there is no family court, in Karnataka, it is the senior civil judge who entertains petitions under the matrimonial laws for restitution of conjugal rights, judicial separation, nullity of marriage, dissolution of marriage, that is divorce, divorce, divorce by mutual consent. Now let us take a case where there is a family court established. The regular civil judge doesn't know whether that family court has jurisdiction over the entire district or only over the place where there is a district headquarter. Office doesn't know it. Lawyers do not bring to its notice. Now let us say a husband files a petition for divorce under the Hindu Marriage Act and Special Marriage Act and Divorce Act before a senior civil judge. He entertains a petition. A decree for divorce is granted by the senior civil judge. As on that date, there was that family court. In fact, the family court had says if a, sue, if a petition is filed in the regular court, if during the pendency of that petition, a family court is established in that area, that petition shall get transferred to the family court. It is a statutory transfer. So nothing has been done. The senior civil judge continues with the proceedings, passes a decree for divorce. There is a decree. Wife files a suit for maintenance against the husband. A youngster should know maintenance is not just under 125 CRPC or under Section 24 and 25 of the Hindu Marriage Act or this famous Domestic Violence Act. A civil suit also lies. It is the right of a wife, right of a parent, right of children to have many minor children to have maintenance from their husbands, parents and children. A civil suit. So wife files a suit for maintenance. Husband says, you are no longer my wife. I have obtained a decree for dissolution against you. True, you have obtained a decree. Which is that court which has given you the decree? A court which did not have jurisdiction at all. Court says, did you challenge the decree? No, I did not challenge. It's a void decree. I am entitled to ignore it. This is called challenge by way of a collateral proceeding. What is the suit that the wife has filed? The wife has filed a suit for maintenance. The suit is not for setting aside the decree for divorce passed by that court which was not competent. Please understand this distinction very clearly. Suit is filed by the wife for maintenance. It is not a suit filed for cancellation of the decree or setting aside the decree passed by that civil judge who had no jurisdiction. In a collateral proceeding, in a totally different proceeding for maintenance, this wife who has suffered a decree at the hands of a court which had no jurisdiction can challenge this validity of this decree. This is called collateral attack. It is not a direct attack by filing a suit for setting aside the decree. It is a collateral attack. The main proceeding, the proceeding itself is for maintenance. In that maintenance suit, she can attach the decree. True, you have obtained the decree. I did not challenge it. I need not challenge it because it is a wide decree. Now I am raising that question. So it is a collateral attack. It is a collateral proceeding also that can be challenged. Now, the Family Court Act says, if there is a property dispute between the husband and wife, the Family Court can entertain it. Supposing a suit for partition is filed by the wife, implying not only the husband but others also. And the family court thinks, well, suit for partition, the husband is a party, wife is a party, can entertain it. No, family court can entertain a dispute only between the husband and wife, not necessarily uh, the restitution of conjugal rights, divorce and judicial separation, even in respect of a property dispute. But the suit that I am referring to is not confined only to husband and wife, 
but certain other persons are also parties. The family court ignores it and passes the decree for partition or whatever decree it is. We may have declaration of title, if you are the wife, husband, whatever it is. It is a wide decree as far as those persons are concerned because it has been passed by a court which had no competence at all. Maybe even for these people because uh, it has been passed by a court which had no competence. So the legal position is by consent of parties, court does not get jurisdiction. Court cannot assume jurisdiction by consent of parties. Well, we have no problem. The family court is situated in the district headquarters, far away from this place, we can't go. We have no objection for this court to go on. So jurisdiction cannot be conferred by parties by their consent. Jurisdiction has to be conferred by a statute. So a wide decree number one can be ignored. It can be challenged by way of an appeal or revision, whatever is provided. It can be challenged by way of a separate suit. It can be challenged in execution proceedings. It can be challenged in collateral proceedings. I will give the decisions at the end. Now, let us have a look at section 11. I am not dealing with it in great detail. As all of you know, if a decree is passed by a competent court and finally disposed of, deciding the issues, a subsequent suit will not lie. The subsequent suit is hit by the principles of res judicata. All of you know it. But in what situations that res judicata would apply? One condition is it should be by a competent court. Section 11 itself would tell it. Uh, no court shall try any suit or issue in which the matter directly and substantially in issue has been directly and substantially in issue in a former suit between the same parties or between the parties under whom they are any of them claim litigating under the same title in a court competent to try such subsequent suit. Therefore, the competency is important here. Of course, a court of limited jurisdiction has also competence. All that is by way of explanation. Keep this in view. The basic principle contained in section 11 is res judicata. If there is already an adjudication, a subsequent suit will not lie. We will find a reflection of this in section 40 of the Indian Evidence Act 1872. The corresponding provision in the new enactment is section 34. For pattern similar. So even if you have the Act of 1872, there you can put it Section 34 of 2023. Absolutely verbatim similar. I will read Section 40 of the Evidence Act. You may be surprised why while speaking to CPC I am referring to Evidence Act. Judicial officers who have joined know that I speak to different enactments when I take up something, whatever is related. For advocates may look at some things Speaking about CPC goes to Evidence Act. Certainly, I am speaking something relevant because Evidence Act speaks of only relevancy. Re please read Section 40, which is 34 of the uh, New Act. Mm -hmm. The existence of any judgment, order or decree, which by law prevents any court from taking cognizance of a suit, which is that judgment, there is already a judgment passed by a court. Section 11 prevents the court from taking part in the CPC or holding a trial is a relevant fact when the question is whether such court ought to take partisans of such suit or hold such trial. The corresponding provision in CRPC is 300, Article 20 of the Constitution, Principle of Double Geo Party, attribute.
You are now able to hear me. Yes. Huh? Yes. Now, in the subsequent suit, well, the plaintiff in the previous suit who is now the defendant says that there is already a suit. Therefore, the suit would not lie. That is what section 40. So, therefore, what is it that he is required to show? Because section 40 is in that part related to judgments of courts of justice when relevant. So, a, a judgment is also irrelevant. So, a judgment passed by a court which was seized of this matter, a competent court has given a decree. In a subsequent suit, this judgment becomes relevant. How to prove that? We will have to produce certified copies of the pleadings, judgment, issues and all that. That is a different thing when we, uh, section 11 speaks of all that. So, it can be successfully shown that there is already a previous statement proved it. Then 41 says, judgments rendered by probate courts, matrimonial courts, insolvency courts, federality courts, they are judgments in REM and uh, whatever is declared by that is conclusive through the patch stated therein. And then 42 says, judgments, orders or decrees other than those mentioned in 41 are in the related to matters of public nature. Now, you will find that 44 is an exception to 40, 41 and 42. Fraud or collusion in obtaining judgment or incompetency of the court may be proved. The corresponding section in 2003 enactment is 36. <coughs> I am not, uh, not 36. It is 38. I am sorry. It is 38. Section 44, corresponding section in the new enactment is 38. <clears throat> any party to a suit or other proceeding may show that any judgment, order or decree, which is relevant under section 40, 41 or 42, and which has been proved by the adverse party. How is that proved? By a production of a certified copy of the judgment, pleadings, issues and everything, was delivered by a court not competent to deliver it. It's for our non judice It had no inherent jurisdiction. Therefore, the principle of res judicata would not apply. A judgment rendered by a court not competent to deliver it. Competence in the sense of jurisdiction of the subject matter of the suit is quorum non judice It's a wide judgment. It is a nullity. That would not operate as res judicata. So, therefore, <coughs> This B, who is the plaintiff in the subsequent suit, true, there is certainly a decree against me. I don't dispute it. But I am still entitled to maintain the second suit because the decree is passed by a court, not competent to do it. Not competent to do it. So, therefore, in that matter where I refer to divorce proceeding, a decree for divorce has been given. I said a maintenance suit, a collateral proceeding. But some, some other suit, why files a petition for restitution of conjugal rights? No, there is already a decree. Fine. Who has passed it? I can still urge. Well, I am entitled to restitution of conjugal rights. You have got a duty to take me back. The decree that you have obtained is an illegal. So, therefore, 44 is an exception to it. One exception is when the decree is passed by a court not competent to deliver it. Yes, plus I will come later. Second thing is, if it is obtained by fraud or by collusion, first I will deal with this collusion. This happens many times. A files a suit against B for some relief, declaration, specific performance, eviction, all these things are done. This B defendant gives a show of contest. He will be watching the proceedings. If he finds that the summons is returned, he will not uh, stand up. The lawyer will also not stand up. If the endorsement is that the summons is duly served and the court is inclined to proceed ex parte, then the defendant will appear and say, I may be given time, will engage a lawyer. Or some lawyer would say, well, oh, is this the matter? So case number so and so, well, I have instructions to appear. I file a memo of undertaking or next date I file a memo of undertaking or it will be passed over. Next day I will file that Vatala. So this goes on and we also honestly believe that there is a real contest. It goes on 
one fine day the matter is referred to Lotha Dalit or he passes, he gives complete uh, consent for the decree. Well, if you are satisfied that it is a clear case of consent or judgment and admission, certainly we can pass it. Ultimately, it may turn out to be a collusive suit. Neither the plaintiff has title or the defendant has title. Somebody else's property. Such a decree is passed. That decree will not operate as restudicator. Number one, a decree passed by an incompetent court does not operate as restudicator. A decree passed in a suit which is signed by collusion between the parties does not operate as restudicator in view of section 44 of the Evidence Act corresponding provision 38. Then what is this fraud? Fraud on the court. Some material documents are suppressed. Existence of a previous proceeding is suppressed. Relationship is suppressed. As we often say, parties are not come to the court with clean hands. Something has happened. It is a fraud on the court. So if a decree is obtained by practicing fraud on the court, that decree is void. One decree which is void is quorum non judis passed by a court which had no jurisdiction, passed by a person by in the absence of a judge. Another is if it is by collusion. Another is by a fraud. This is the position in that regard. Now, we will refer to a few judgments in this regard. <clears throat> We will make a beginning from this beautiful judgment of the Supreme Court in 1994, Volume 1, SCC, Page 1. 1994, Volume 1, SCC, Page 1. S.P. Chandalavaraya Naidu versus Jagannath. S.P. Chandalavaraya Naidu versus Jagannath. This decision actually does not deal with section 44 of the Evidence Act. But the principle behind section 44 is seen in this judgment. It is a judgment of the Supreme Court, 1994, 1 SCC page 1. The very first para in this judgment reads like this. Fraud avoids all judicial acts, ecclesiastical or temporal, even in religious matters, even in temporal matters, that is uh, uh, something relating to our daily life, material life. In Tarada, we say Laukita, Laukita Vyohara, Matu Adhyatmika Samanbudu, both ecclesiastical and temporal. Temporary, temporal, because we believe that it is only a temporary world, our world is elsewhere. So it's a temporal work, ecclesiastical or temporal. Observe whom? Chief Justice Edward Court of England about three centuries ago. That means even three centuries ago, 300, 300 years prior to 1995. It would take us to 1965. Even in those days, fraud used to be played by people. By playing fraud on the court is a nullity and non est in the eyes of law. Such a judgment or decree by the first court or by the highest court has to be treated as a nullity by every court, whether superior or inferior. It can be challenged in any court, even in collateral proceedings. So, therefore, in collateral proceedings, there can be challenged a wide decree, a quorum non judice passed by a court, not competent to pass it, no jurisdiction, obtained by fraud, obtained by pollution. This refers to fraud. Now, there is some interesting passage here. The High Court, against the judgment of which the matter reached the Supreme Court, had made some observation there. It is no part of the duty of the plaintiff to state true facts in the plaint. He need not set out true facts. The High Court had taken such a view. The, it is, there is no duty cast on the plaintiff. The Supreme Court said we can't approve of this. The facts of the present case leave no manner of doubt that Jagannath obtained the preliminary decree by playing fraud at the court. 
A fraud is an act of deliberate deception with the design of securing something by taking unfair advantage of another. It is a deception in order to gain by another's loss. It is a cheating intended to get an advantage. Jagannath was working as a clerk with the Sautar. He purchased the property in the court auction on behalf of Sautar. He had on his own volition executed the registered release deed in favor of Sautar regarding the property in dispute. He knew that the appellants had paid the total digital amount to his master Sautar. Without disclosing the, all these facts, he filed the suit for the partition of the property at the ground that he had purchased the property on his own behalf and not on behalf of Sautar. Non-production and even non-mentioning of the release deed at the trial tantamounts to playing fraud on the court. We do not agree with the observations of the High Court that the apparent defendants could have easily produced the certified registered copy of that release deed and non-suited the plaintiff. A litigant who approaches the court is bound to produce all the documents executed by him which are relevant to the litigation. If he withholds a vital document in order to gain advantage on the other side that he would be guilty, then he would be guilty of playing fraud on the court as well as on the... Now, what is the observation of the High Court? The High Court uh, in turn referred to some decision and made these observations. From this decision, it is followed that except proceedings for probate and other proceedings, where a duty is cast upon a party litigant to disclose all the facts, in other cases, there is no legal duty cast upon the plaintiff to come to a court with a true case and to prove it by true evidence. So, High Court observes in that case, by referring to some other case, except in probate proceedings and other proceedings, there is no duty cast, duty cast on the plaintiff to come to the court with a true case and prove it by true evidence. The Supreme Court did not agree with this. As I told you, section 44 of the Evidence Act is not referred to here, but this would help us to know what this concept of fraud is. This decision telling us what is the effect of fraud has been followed subsequently in <coughs> 2006, Volume 7, SCC 416. 2006, Volume 7, SCC 416. Hamsa Haji versus State of Kerala. Hamsa Haji versus State of Kerala. In para 20 of this decision, we find a reference to this uh, SP Chengalwara unit. Well, this directly deals with section 44. Para 15, the law in India is not different. Section 44 of the evidence that enables a party, otherwise bound by a previous adjudication and principle of restudicator to show that it was not final or binding because it is vitiated by fraud. The provision therefore gives jurisdiction, which is the provision 44 of the evidence act, gives jurisdiction and authority to a court to consider and decide the question whether a prior adjudication is vitiated by fraud. Uh, some uh, earlier decisions, then reference is made in para 20 to this general one. Then, subsequently, this has been followed in 2012, 11 SCC 574. 2012, 11 SCC 574. Well, of course, that is in different context under Order 12. So, anyway, the fact that this decision is referred to in two subsequent judgments is an indication that it is a leading decision on the point of this fraud. So, pollution I have explained, fraud I have explained, incompetency I have explained, with the best of competence I have. Now, one decision regarding this incompetency of the court, 1995, 4 SCC 163, 1995, 4 SCC 163, Ashrafi Lal versus Poili, 1995, 4 SCC 163, para 8 of this judgment. <laughs> Referring to some earlier judgment, the same principle would apply to a judgment of a court in an earlier suit or proceeding. 
The judgment of a competent court is normally binding in the parties to the proceeding and it operates as res judicata in a subsequent proceeding between the same parties. An exception to the said rule is drafted by section 44 of the Evidence Act, which provides that any party to a suit or other proceeding may show <coughs> that any judgment or order or decree which is relevant under section 40, 41 and 42 and which has been proved by the adverse party was delivered by a court not competent to deliver it or is obtained by fraud or collusion. The effect of the said provision is that a judgment delivered by a court not competent to deliver it or a judgment which is obtained by fraud or collusion does not operate as restudicata and is bad binding on the parties to that proceeding. A judgment can be avoided in a subsequent proceeding by a party which is able to show that it was delivered by a court not competent to deliver it or it was obtained by fraud or collusion. Since such a judgment does not operate as restudicata, it is not necessary to institute a proceeding for setting it aside. A party to a proceeding against whom a judgment in an earlier suit is relied can successfully avoid the said judgment if it can establish in the subsequent proceeding, that is what I said, a collateral proceeding, that the said judgment was delivered by a court not competent to deliver it or that it was obtained by fraud or collusion. I repeat, say direct attack is by filing an appeal or revision or by filing a suit. Collateral attack is the suit is not filed for relief to set aside the decree. Some other suit is filed. In that suit, if the opponent rises well, there is already a decree. There he can say that decree does not bind me because it is passed by an incompetent court. It is passed by a court where one of the parties played fraud. It is passed by because there was a collusion between the parties. Now, this would uh, take care of the issue that I wanted to deal. As I said, one kind of decree is a consent decree against which no appeal lies under 96.3. As the Honorable Supreme Court has put it, a compromise decree is also a consent decree and therefore no appeal lies. So no appeal under section 96 or 41 lies. Then what's the remedy? Please have a look at Order 23, Group 3A. I have spoken exhaustively on entire Order 23 at the last occasion, withdrawal and compromise. I am not referring to anything beyond the Order 23, Rule 3A in this session. <coughs> because if I refer to withdrawal, Vitas Chetra will ask me to withdraw from the session immediately because it is already 8. We will take up only. Order 23, Rule 3A. No suit shall lie to set aside a decree on the ground that the compromise on which the decree is based was not lawful. <clears throat> now, what is that lawful? Go to explanation. 2. Order 23, Rule 3. An agreement or compromise which is void or voidable under the Indian Contract Act shall not be deemed to be lawful within the meaning of this rule. So, there cannot be a separate suit to challenge a compromise decree. An appeal under 96 Rebbit Order 41 is also barred in view of 96.3. Decree obtained by consent, no appeal lies, no suit lies. What then is the remedy? First, let us exhaust the statutory provisions, specific statutory provisions. I repeat, no appeal, no suit in your Order 23, Rule 3A. Then what then? Then have a look at Order 43, Rule 1, Capital A, Sub Rule 2. Order 43, Rule 1, Capital A, Sub Rule 2. In an appeal against 83 passed in a suit, after retarding a compromise or refusing to retard a compromise, it shall be open to the appellant to contest the decree on the ground that the compromise should or should not have been retarded. We will have to carefully read this provision. In an appeal against a decree passed in a suit, the appeal that is contemplated herein is 
an appeal under section 96 right with order 41 in that appeal against the decree that is passed after recording the compromise or refusing to record a compromise this is the it requires some explanation please hear me very carefully i must very honestly tell you i had also lot of difficulty in understanding this uh, provision after going through the case class and other things now i am able to i believe that i am able to articulate it in a better manner you see please have a look at order 23 rule 3 itself first Order twenty three rule three speaks of a decree based on compromise. There is a proviso attached to twenty three rule three, provided that where it is alleged by one party and denied by the other, that an adjustment or satisfaction has been arrived at, the court shall decide the question, but no adjournment shall be granted. Now let us say. The plaintiff A is ready with a compromise petition. The defendant B might have also signed that compromise petition, or he might have put his thumb up for whatever reason it is. Or A believes in the court, he will do it in the open court. He will do it. The defendant lawyer also tells, "No, my client will come to the court in the presence of the judge himself. He would admit the compromise and sign the compromise petition, or he has done it by some force or somebody." Now, before passing a decree and compromise or accepting the compromise. A judge is required to satisfy himself about two things. Number one, about the voluntariness of the parties. Have they given really consent? Is it by their own volition, free consent? Secondly, is it lawful? These are the two requirements. Now, this B says, "No, I have not signed it. This is not my signature." Or he may say, "I was forced to sign. The plaintiff lawyer forced me, or my own lawyer forced me." Plaintiff said, "I will pay you one lakh before the matter is taken up before the court. Therefore, I sign it. He has not paid. I have not entered into a compromise. So this is a case where there is a dispute as to whether there is a compromise or not. In which event, the court has to hold an inquiry whether there is a compromise or not. B asserts that there is no compromise. A asserts that there is a compromise." The court, after holding inquiry, comes to a conclusion that there is a compromise. Please understand this. Court, after coming to a conclusion that there is a compromise, passes a decree on compromise. This is not a consent decree under ninety six three CPC for this B to remain silent. For him, it is not a compromise decree because even now he asserts that I did not consent for compromise. So this is a case covered by Order Forty Three, Rule One A Two, which says, "Well, I also seek for better enlightenment from others." This is how I have understood it with some very difficulty to tell you very frankly. In an appeal against a decree passed in a suit after recording a compromise, here there is a problem. I refuse to record a compromise. Now, as far as the this B is concerned, it is not a compromise decree at all. He did not agree for that. He can challenge it. Now, let us say A says there is a compromise. B says there is no compromise. Court accepts the stand of B and says that there is not.
You are now able to hear. Are you able to yes, hear sir. me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll just close. I think uh, time is uh, coming. Another 10 minutes, I'll just close. So now, the court does say, after holding an inquiry under the proviso to R23 rule 3, he says, no, there is no compromise at all. It proceeds to pass a decree on merits. Right. One person is accused by that. Let us say the suit is dismissed. Plaintiff files an appeal under section 96 saying, there is already a compromise. The court did not accept the compromise and it has proceeded to pass a decree on merits. There in that appeal, which we call as a regular appeal under section 96, one of the grounds that the, that the plaintiff or the appellant can take is there had been a compromise. Instead of accepting the compromise and passing the decree, the court has proceeded to pass a decree on merits. I am not so there one ground can be urged. Now, this year, then courts have said the other remedy is by 151. Of course, 43 Rule 18, it contemplates an appeal under 96 where one of the grounds could be this. But 151 is what the courts have said. It is the only way by which a compromise decree can be challenged. Uh, I am not... Uh, Referring to the ratio laid down in all these decisions, because last time I have already given those decisions, I am quickly referring to the citations. I am avoiding the parties' names because it takes a good lot of time. Particularly in one decision, it is very difficult to even spell the names of the parties. Too long a name. I will just give the citations, one or two, which I did not notice earlier or which was reported later. 1993, Volume 1, SCC 581. For this, I will give the party's name because this is the first decision of the point. Banwari Lal versus Chando Devi, 1993, 1, SCC 581, Para 9. Then, 2005, 6, SCC 300. 2005 6 SCC 300. It is in this decision that uh, 43 rule, the reason is there was a provision under order 43 rule 1 to challenge a compromise decree. 43 rule 1M, it provided for an appeal against a compromise decree that has been deleted by 1976 amendment. In its place, in a different forum, we have this 43 rule 1A2. Then we have 2006 5 SCC 566. 2006 5 SCC 566. Here again, I am giving the party's name, mostly for the reason it is easy to pronounce. Pushpa Devi Bhagat versus Rajinder Singh. Secondly, because it is of Justice R.V. Ravindran, whom I have already a number of occasions told you, summarizes the entire legal position. Section para 70 of this statement, the position that emerges from the amended provisions of Order 23 can be summed up thus. No appeal is maintainable against a consent decree having regard to the specific bar contained in 96.3. No appeal is maintainable against the order of the court regarding the compromise or refusing to regard a compromise in view of deletion of clause M of Rule 1 of Order 43. No independent suit can be filed for setting aside a compromise decree on the ground that the compromise was not lawful in the bar contained in Rule 3A. A consent decree operates as a restable and is valid and binding unless it is set aside by the court which passes the consent, unless it is set aside by the court which passes the competent decree, that by the reference court, by an order on an application under the proviso to Rule 3 of Order 23, that is read with 151. Then we have 2008, 8 SCC 348, 2008, 8 SCC 348. Uh, in fact, uh, all these earlier judgments have been referred to. You may read para 14. Then, we have this decision which requires some explanation. Till this, we had no problem. The principle of law which we had understood 
which I assert, which we had rightly understood was a compromise binds the parties to the compromise and obviously parties to the suit. It cannot bind a stranger. The bar under Order 23 Rule 3A can be only for a party to the compromise. For a stranger it cannot. I told you about the collusive suit. A and B file a suit. It is a collusive suit. There is a consent decree. Right. A and B are barred by 96 stream to uh, file a appeal. They can't file a suit because it has been described to be a compromise decree or 23 root 3 is a bar. How is that C who is affected by this decree? His property is uh, uh, his rights are in Jiva party because of this compromise decree between A and B, a collusive decree or some other decree. Or certain facts not have been brought to the notice of the court. He may have an independent title. This C is not bound very compromised. This, this is a basic uh, principle which we are following. There appears to be some, I am guardedly using the word appears to be, a slight deviation in this Triloki Nath Singh versus Aniruddha Singh. Triloki Nath Singh versus Aniruddha Singh, 2020. Volume 6, SCC 629. You are hearing? Are you, yes, 2020, Volume 6, SCC 629. This decision at first blush gives an indication that even a third party is barred by Order 23, Rule 3A from challenging a compromise, uh, from filing a separate suit. He can't file a separate suit. His remedy is also to approach the very same court in, by way of a petition under 151. This gives that indication at first blush. Usually, head notes also we will tell us. That's the impression that has uh, that many have gained on reading this judgment. Of course, the Karnataka High Court has clarified it. But there is some indication in this very judgment itself to say that the bar under Order 23 Rule 3A is confined to the parties to the compromise. Para 22 of this judgment reads like this. Indeed, the appellant was not a party to the stated compromise decree. Fine. He was, however, claiming the right title and interest over the land referred to in the stated sale dictated so and so which was purchased by him from so-and-so judgment debtor and party to the suit. It is well settled that the compromise decree passed by the High Court in the second appeal would relate back to the date of institution of the suit between the parties. In the suit now instituted by the plaintiff, at best, he could see relief against so-and-so, but cannot be allowed to question the compromise decree. Therefore, the person who filed that independent suit, in this case, was claiming under a party who was a party to the compromise. The Karnataka High Court had an occasion to clarify this. It may be a little difficult to use the expression clarification because uh, technically the High Court cannot clarify it. Well, for lawyers and uh, uh, judges, we can take it as a clarification given by the High Court rather or explained by the High Court. ILR 2021 Karnataka 338 Sushila versus Vijay Kumar. In this decision, or rather in this case, this uh, Triloki Nath Singh was cited. The High Court said in that case, the person who had filed the independent suit was claiming under a party to the earlier suit which ended in compromise and therefore there is a bar. Whereas 22 and 23 of this judgment are important. As far as the reliance placed on the decision of the Honorable Supreme Court is concerned, as could be noticed in the case of Trilokna process itself, as could be noticed in the case itself, in that case itself, the person who had filed a suit challenging compromise was claiming his rights under a person who was a party to the compromise that had been entered into in the said suit and in that context the appellate court 
Apex court had held that even if the plaintiff was not a party, the bar under Rule 3 would apply. Para 23. As could be seen from the above, that is not the scenario in this case. In the instant case, the plaintiff was not claiming any rights under any of the persons. So, therefore, we can take it that the Lord uh, would indicate a bar even to a stranger if he is claiming under a party to the otherwise not. Then we may read 2021 9 SCC 114. 2021 9 SCC 114. Just don't read the first five head notes because they do not deal with Order 23. They deal with uh, family law, Hindu law, partition, and all that. Normally, I don't refer to any head note because in this case, I have made a note of the head note only to uh, know for myself that this decision also deals with Order 23. Relevant paras are paras 53 to 59. They deal with the entire scope of this Order 23 rule. Then, 2022, 5 SCC 449, 2022, 5 SCC 449, paras 21 and 22. Empty, if it is fraud and other things. Now, one more thing. See, in this case, uh, challenge to compromise decree was not accepted uh, because they wanted to get that compromise decree amended under 152 CPC. The court said 152 is meant for correcting some clerical or arithmetical errors or typographical errors. There cannot be a, a challenge to a compromise decree under 152 CPC. Then 2022, 5 SCC 736. <laughs> <laughs> 2022 5 SCC 736 Para 101, 103, and 104. 84 to 93, 95, 96, 101, 103, and 104. Perhaps this 52 and 23 decisions I had not cited in the last occasion. Now, what all has spoken about challenge to a compromise decree passed in a court? Now we have this compromise decrees in Rotadala. God might be placed, may be played on the Lotha Dalat. There could be a collusion also there. There, what's the remedy? If a decree passed, or rather, technically speaking, an award is passed by the Lotha Dalat, where is to be challenged? This is by way of a writ before the High Court. This is made clear in 2008, Volume 2, SCC 660. 2008, Volume 2, SCC 660. This should be sufficient. But uh, since there are some judicial officers about the care they need to take while entertaining these compromise matters in Lotha Dala, we may again refer to another beautiful judgment of Justice R. V. Ravindran in 2009, 2 SCC 198. I am not going into details because uh, uh, I am not referring to any provision of the Legal Series Authority Act or anything. That is not subject for discussion. Since I refer to this challenge to an award passed by Lotha Dalat, I thought it better to bring to the notice of the judicial officers here as to the care that they are required to take while sitting in Lotha Dalat. This is 2009. 2 SCC 198, uh, paras 8, 9 and 18, paras 8, 9 and 18, 
the Lordship Justice Ravindran has referred to the provisions of Legal Services Authorities Act and downright in my duty. With this, I am done. Though I have given the title to the topic as modes of challenging a various decree, in the heart of my heart, I was only particular about explaining to the audience the concept of a wide decree and the concept of quorum non juris. If what I have said has reached the audience effectively, I believe that my presentation would not be quorum non juris. I will take it, the presentation, not competence in the sense of uh, intellectual competence. I will take it, a person who has jurisdiction to speak over it has spoken about it. I am not worried about other things. If incidentally you want to remember those things, I have no problem. In the heart of my heart, my whole thrust was to tell you what a wide decree is. There also, it is quorum non judice Because there is some impression gained by 99 CPC that want of jurisdiction can be made a ground of attack in an appeal that is permissible only when it is passed by a court which had no inherent jurisdiction, an incompetent court, quorum non judice Then section 44 of the evidence act says, decree is passed by incompetent courts then obtained by fraud and collusion, do not operate as res judicata. So if I have conveyed these things effectively, there will be res judicata for me also because I can't speak on the same subject because I have completely dealt with this. So let me not speak about this again on some other occasion. So if you have understood that concept of quorum non judice incompetency of a court, what a wide decree is, I think my presentation will be successful. So, thank you, Mr. Vitas and Trivikram. Any questions, I will take it, provided that your Zoom meeting is in, because I have exceeded my time. I know no. it. <laughs> once you know that, uh, once you come to the platform, we know that we will be uh, it, it doesn't gain will be two hours, and uh, we will be it will be a power pack program where back to back. We will have the knowledge. Like you said that it was a session. You hit the bullseye. Everything so elucidatedly explained that everyone would be enjoying it. So three questions had come separately. Yes, please. It's, yes. Uh, though not directly with the decree, etc. It says, let's assume there's an order which is void uh, without jurisdiction on the ex executive side. Is there any limitation to challenge that and under what provision it will no, be challenged? No. no. First of all, there is no need to challenge. Secondly, when there is no need to challenge, there is no question of a limitation. So, uh, he has given me this example with the, it's a service matter. Let's assume an order of uh, punishment. Well, my own knowledge it, about service matters is limited. No, that order is without jurisdiction. That order was yes. not by the competent authority. But yes. It is still operational. So, if you have to challenge it, whether there will be any limitation to challenge that? Uh, no, there, are, there is one aspect. If the challenge is only by way of a writ, my own knowledge of British jurisdiction High Court is very limited. In fact, uh, Vitas Chatrath is more competent to speak about it. A writ court, to my understanding, does not entertain matters if there is an inordinate delay. Though there is no period of limitation as such, inordinate delay in challenging something before a writ court. Maybe a ground for not entertaining it. Uh, limitation as such, my first principles of law would tell me that there cannot be a question of limitation there. I stand corrected. If it has to somebody. In, sir, otherwise, in rich they say that broad principles of limitation would apply. Uh, it cannot be dismissed on the ground of. They say it will be uh, dismissed on the ground of delay and latches, not on the mm -hmm. limitation. But they yes. say for a delay in latches, normally three years, that's a Supreme Court constitutional bench, Bhai Lal Bhai. But yes. if that order is without jurisdiction, like you said, you don't have to challenge it. But if that order is void, Ebony Show, so uh, what will no be... Need to challenge. No, need, no need to challenge. No, but it is affecting that employee. That's why I'm asking. I, as a judge, dismiss an employee of the revenue department. He is bound by that. A simple example. I'm a district judge. 
there is an employee of the revenue department he does not honor the court summons i will say he has not honored the court summons i will dismiss him for what jurisdiction i have he did not challenge that at all he can ignore that but Even in case the department acts upon it huh? i go a step further in case the department acts upon it and you don't challenge it within the petition then what will be the effect there all the point is this sir. first of all according to me there is no point of limitation you say the red court doesn't entertain it even then what i tell is if a district judge dismisses an employee of the cooperative society uh, mostly this revenue departments and police because uh, others we don't have much contact some revenue department official does not turn up before the court does not produce the documents the police officer does not come the judge is fed up with up saying i dismiss you from service passes are ordered what is its effect totally corrupt law jurists right yeah. i can he can even ignore that uh, the next question is let's assume you have submitted to a jurisdiction uh, and ultimately you challenge it can there be any uh, uh, you no. can say what i said to law jurists parties cannot confer jurisdiction on a court if it is a case of territorial or pecuniary jurisdiction in your section 21 and 212 then uh, 99 cpc as explained by the supreme court in the kiran singh relevant provisions of the court fees act well unless there is a failure of justice which is very difficult to demonstrate no question of uh, there it is a bar but if it is want of clear lack of jurisdiction jurisdiction of the subject matter inherent jurisdiction certainly even by consent as i said in the family court the wife does not raise the question of jurisdiction husband does not raise the question of jurisdiction all right the family court is situated elsewhere will go it i even go to the extent of saying even if it is a decree by mutual consent well which is that court which has given that decree the court which had no top itself at all so you can't confer jurisdiction when it does not exist at all it's a basic principle So yes, that uh, that your judgment of two thousand six volume seven SCC four sixty six will prevail. You refer to what which judgment? Two thousand six volume seven SCC four sixty six. Ah oh, yes, yeah, that is yes in the context of fraud that has been explained in the context of fraud. What is what is, so what is issue? What judgment will be there? Ninety five volume four SCC. The point is this, sir. See, it is a simple situation where the court had no initial jurisdiction at all, inherent jurisdiction at all. Parties submit themselves. It is a judgment for a non-judice. There is no need to challenge it. It can be challenged by way of for appeal. It can be challenged by way of a revision. If a revision remedy is available, it can be challenged by way of a suit. It can be challenged in collateral proceedings. It can be challenged in execution proceedings. It can be totally ignored. No question of limitation there. And then the, the third question was what you had uh, taken up. A party who is not a uh, party uh, to the compromise of, between the two parties. Yes. So whether he will have to challenge it or it will uh, or he can say it is not binding because he was not a party. No, not at all. Binding. i am not a party to it i will give you another example i own this flat right somebody sells this flat to you by registered sale deed right i come to know about it, but i don't challenge it at all why why should the person who has no title himself has sold the property to you but the fact that there is a registered sale deed in your favor you are likely to act on that registered sale deed get the mutation done and everything Come to me saying, "Well, I obtained a sale deed. Uh, please vacate." There is that uh, I am likely to be prejudiced. Therefore, Section Thirty One of the Specific Law Act says, "If that instrument is void or voidable, he is likely to prejudice the plaintiff. He may institute a suit, and a remedy is provided. If he does not do it, all right. I don't say the property belongs to me. Who is that expert sold the property to Mr. Vidas Chetra or Trivikra? No." I don't recognize it. I can keep it, but if I want to challenge it, Section Thirty One of the Statute of Claims Act provides for a suit. There, of course, there is that limitation and all that. Article Fifty Eight and all that will come. Article in that process, in that process itself, they say let's assume a property has been mortgaged to a bank. Huh. Property has been mortgaged to a bank. A bank. 
but yeah. but that party uh, by way of a mutual consent and exclusive decree they say that this property i am handing over to my another brother so what will be the effect of that handing over to whom handing over to he they enter into compromise is that this property is not being transferred in the Ale, name of my brother by way of bank and the mortgager enter into a compromise or who enters no, into no, a compromise no the two brothers one who was who is mortgaged and said they enter into a compromise they enter into a compromise to what the party has entered a decree they enter into a compromise in terms of which who gets the property one of them gets the property a mortgage a has mortgage to the bank yes and the a gives the property by way of a exclusive decree to his brother saying that i am transferring yes. this without any reference of that mortgage what will be the okay. effect there the See, same the point is this, that nobody can be giving a give better title than what he is he can't say a was the person who mortgaged the property if a had title to the property at the date of mortgage by this compromise or by this uh, release deed sale deed gifted or whatever it is it cannot happen so he has to challenge that all the point is this the in the case of a mortgage the position is different here the reason is the property was mortgaged by a on a representation that he was the owner of the property bank believed him and accepted it and lent the loan now this transfer by a to b it is subsequent to the mortgage Yes. If B, by virtue of that uh, transfer, has become the owner of the property, in a suit to be filed by that uh, mortgagee bank for recovery of money for a preliminary decree for sale, Article Thirty Four, Rule One says, all parties interested in the right of redemption will have to be made a party to the suit. So, the title in a mortgage suit, the question of title is not involved there. it is the right of the mortgagee to recover money now the question is since some other party has also come into picture ultimately what happens is a preliminary decree for sale followed by a final decree if the final decree is also not complied with the property would be sold in which event the property as on the date of the court sale would not be belonging to the mortgager it would have gone to his brother or someone else so there that problem would arise and therefore order 34 rule one says all persons interested in the equity of redemption shall be added as a party to the mortgage suit the position in a mortgage is quite different here. okay did you follow it thank you thank you i will ask the victim to share his knowledge i, not I knowledge. just uh, had this doubt and i just wanted to convey and take more clarification there was one of the latest judgment reported judgment by our honorable high court Uh, repudiation is the only remedy against a compromise decree passed in lok adalat especially when it is obtained in fraud our yes, honorable yes. justice shishananda sir's judgment is there who so yes. can sir uh, throw some light on this that we will have more clarity like if you have the citation or case number you can also tell it participate please sir it is msa msa 10010 of 2021 I repeat, MSA that is Miscellaneous Second Appeal, one triple zero one zero of twenty twenty one decided in Darwar Bench, decided on second February twenty four. I think judgment was recently uh, released. Very good. Uh, so that yes. would be some continuation of the present discussion. I felt yes, so. So definitely, definitely. Thank you for uh, adding to the. discussion thank you sir so the last question we can take is uh, respected sir in a mortgage decree uh, decree holder can file a uh, sale proceeds this question is incomplete no sir uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and thank you to uh, sir and your son we are all obliged that they always take out the time to help us to join and learn from you thank you everyone stay and safe my end also sir a very spe a special thanks to you thanks to mr uh, subramanya kaushik your daughter in law there are so many other uh, learned presiding officers who have joined uh, the session we also have other members of the bar students uh, our uh, main host mr vikas chatrat so indebted to all of you thank you so much
participation. Right. Sometimes I don't think that for students it was useful today. Let me be very honest. No, but still, it's a, it was a different plan. Uh, it's it was very complicated for Allah, the for the I want, to, I want to number of law colleges. Uh, gradually, I'm losing interest in addressing students uh, because some of them they don't have interest. Some of very them they will be laughing. Uh, slowly losing interest in addressing the students because my focus is mainly judicial officers in the judicial academy and any invitation from bar association or bar council to speak to advocates and because Chetra Trivikra certainly I'll be happy to do it because to reach them it will be of some use to them I'll be too glad to do it we so always believe in this session. I also thank you for sharing the platform. No, no. We always believe that we should share because basic definitions, everybody can read it and understand it. But professional knowledge can only be shared by the professional who has an experience like people like you. So thank you, sir, so for sharing your knowledge. In the arbitration center, also students come for as interns. I was also taking a lot of interest and the typists and staff also said, so some students have come, shall we send it? All right. I was taking pleasure. I was explaining to them the whole concept. For a period of time, unless I ask them, they don't open up. And they will immediately open So I only I ask them if you got anything with them. Otherwise, I, on my own, I have stopped uh, asking them anything. Uh, uh, maybe I am a little conservative. And no, no, no. We, we will continue with us. We, uh, we, we will continue. Now, beyond yeah. light will go. It will be at. Thank you. It will be always beyond 8. It will be always beyond 8 p.m. No, we, uh, sometimes you will start at 5 so that it ends up before 8. We will change for that. <laughs> I is a little difficult because Sunday I will take my food between 2.30 and 3. And I need some rest. So right, sir. Thank you. Thank you.